Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, in the words of my favorite streamer, Tim the Tat Man. I hope you guys are having a good day, uh, regardless of where you are. You had a good day, hopefully, or you're having a good day. Let me know if you can hear me in the chat. How do I sound? Is my audio coming out okay? I want to make sure everything's going good before we kick off with our stream. For those of you new to the stream, hi, hello, my name is Ben. Most people online know me as Nahamsek. I am the host of your Sunday stream called the Live Recon Show, where we either hack a company live on stream or we where we bring somebody onto the stream and interview our usually it's a top hacker, someone really well known in the industry, and we ask them about their experience, how they got there, and sometimes we do both. And so if you're new to the stream, you're going to enjoy it, kick back and relax and enjoy it. And if you're not new, I know a lot of familiar faces in the chat. I see a lot of familiar names. Thank you again for coming back. I appreciate it. And welcome back to the stream. This episode is also uh, sponsored by Sneak. If you're not familiar with them, they can scan all of your repositories and your codes and find vulnerabilities within them. I use them sometimes when we do hack the box or try hack me challenges. I just run my code through their uh, CLI and it tells you what the vulnerabilities are and we take a look at it. So the link will be in the chat. If you're watching it, uh, click in the chat and get it. And if you're watching this VOD on YouTube, then the link would be down in the description. All right. So today's guest is someone that's been on the stream in the past before. We've had him uh, come on this stream and we, we had a really good time when he was here last time. And then last week on Monday, when we were doing a random stream, I was doing an AMA, I randomly got on my Instagram and I streamed it on Instagram and Ryan, aka Oday, joined the stream. And then when he left, everyone was like, where is he? Where is he? We wanted to talk to him more. We want to hear from him more. So I, I reached out to him. Like It was super, also, like super, super last minute. I reached out to him. I was like, hey. That stream was really fun, even though it was really uh, small. Do you want to come back and like do an updated version of our, you know, interview and kind of talk about what things have changed and how things are going? And he actually took up uh, the offer, so I'm grateful for him to be here. And I think a lot of you are also excited to have him here. So, before I welcome him to the stream, can I see if any of my BDE squad members are here? If you are, uh, put a BDE in the chat and let me know you're here watching. And let's welcome Ryan, aka Oday, to the show. How you doing, man? Hey, what's going on, man? Good. Thank you so much for doing this super last minute. I really appreciate it. Um, it's great to have you back on here, dude. Oh uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm grateful to be back on here. Yeah, uh, lots of changes since last time we talked about. I think uh, it's been a good two years since you've been on this stream. Uh, we did the keynote together last year at red team village i know i saw you there yeah the year before you came on this stream and we kind of talked about you know how you were the number one hacker on try hack me all that thing other things that have pat and that that happened in the past i want to talk about that but i know there are new people on this stream that may not know who you are give us a quick uh updated version of your <laughs> bio of who you are what do you do now and yeah how'd you get here Okay, so uh, my name's Ryan Montgomery. Um, people call me Zero Day or O Day. Um, either one's acceptable. Um, I, I know that's an ongoing debate. Let me, let me chime in on that. In your last interview I did, people in the comments were like, it's not O Day. You call him O Day. It's Zero Day, not O Day. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, tell me you don't do cybersecurity without telling me you don't do cybersecurity. Right, right. Um, yeah, so so you know, I I've been in the cybersecurity world since I was a child, yeah. and um, I, uh, I the last time I was on this interview, we talked about my position on um, Try Hack Me, which has grown into you know a different type of platform now, but it's yeah. you know still still has plenty of uh, competitive uh, rooms and and challenges, as well as a lot of learning paths for people to learn stuff on. I'm not sponsored by Try Hack Me, nor nor am I an employee of Try Hack Me, but I. You know, I, that's that's how I got involved in the CTF community, which I guess built a name around the zero day um, brand, for better words. Um, I became number one on that leaderboard, and I'm still maintaining number one. And uh, something I actually wanted to address. I just want to get this out of the way for for all you guys. Um, you know, in the cybersecurity infosec world, it's all my interviews recently, and some of the titles were saying, you know. Number one ethical hacker does this, does that. Um, I want to let everyone know that I never proclaimed that I was the number one hacker in the world. Um, you know, I, it was more of 
I guess, social media managers and just the way the internet works. It was never like, hey, my name's Ryan Montgomery and I'm the best hacker in the world. I, that's never came out of my mouth. So I just wanted to make that clear. And You are number one to us, my friend. You've, uh, yeah. I think the number one places deserve from being the number one CTF member on uh, try, hack, uh, try Hack Me. And that is still a number one in a place of being an ethical hacker, man. I, I, know, I know it's a, uh, I don't, nobody wants to claim saying I'm number one in an industry. But you've done a lot of cool work that I think a lot of people respect you as being the number one and, you know, a, a role model, a, you know, an inspiration of that sort. But I, you know, I appreciate the clarity as well. Well, I appreciate it. It's just one of them things where, you know, it, it makes me cringe. It, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, like if some guy came up to me and said, I'm the, I'm the best hacker in the world, I, I would say, you're absolutely not. I have number you know? one. <laughs> yeah, I'm the number one hacker. Well, you good know, for I, you to address that, man. It's very, it's very, you know, at first it's mature of you to do that also, but I think a lot of people know that uh, with the age of social media, people want, it's clicks, right? It's content. We're in a, we're in a digital age of content where people, you know, want to see the thing before they watch it, right? So... Uh, you, I think that you, we're still gonna refer to you as the number one hacker on Try Hack Me because you, you're still on there. Are you still actively hacking on Try Hack Me? Yeah. So you know, they they reduced it from I believe it was three challenges a week, uh, a week to to one challenge that has blood points a week on average. And uh, I still do go for them. I haven't been going for bloods as aggressively as I was prior. And for anyone that doesn't know what blood points are, it's just when you when you solve a challenge before anyone else, you get more points than you know, the other people before you, um, I'm sorry, after you. And uh, I did that for a long time. And, and don't get me wrong, I worked very hard to become number one on TriHack. I think there's almost 2 million users on that site now. So yeah, it's, I do, I am proud of that. But I, like, I you know, just want to clarify, it doesn't make me the best hacker. It just makes me, I guess, number one on TriHack me. Uh, you know, that makes sense. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Uh, so you're still doing TriHack me. I know a lot of things have changed since the last time we talked. I think last time you talked, you said you were going to launch Pentester.com. I know that's been launched. I went on there. Beautiful design already. And I, I saw your team and that kind of stuff. Is, what else has changed? I know you launched Pentester.com. Have, have you been doing anything else? Are you still doing the uh, rehab facilities that you used to do? Are you okay. still talking those? So, so I'll start at the end of it. So the, the rehab facilities, for anyone that doesn't know, um, I, I had three uh, mental health and substance abuse facilities, and they, they changed substance abuse to substance use, but in my brain, it's still substance abuse. Um, I had three facilities, 144 beds with, uh, you know, 120-ish employees, and uh, that's a brick-and-mortar business, meaning, like, you, you go into offices, you have real human beings behind desks, and I was the CEO of all, you know, all of those facilities and the licenses and the pharmacies, and everything was in my name, and uh, I did that for almost... Seven years or a little over seven years. I don't remember the exact uh, time that I was doing it, but it was around there. And, uh, I, you know, I built a bunch of programs around that for various things like, you know, mental health, co-occurring mental health and substance use disorder and uh, trauma therapy, um, EBT, CBT. And then the most important one to me was my scholarship program, which was for people that didn't have money, that didn't have private health insurance, that couldn't afford to travel to South Florida to go to, to treatment. Yeah. Um, like me, you know, I grew up and I didn't have private health insurance. I didn't have all that. And yeah, it's very expensive. And, if, you know, if you don't grow up with rich parents or, you know, if you're not making money as, as a child, and in my case, I, I used drugs as a child and I stopped using them, you know, when I got, when I, even before I became an adult. Um, but back then when I wanted help and I wanted to find a facility, uh, there was, you know, every facility that I had the ability to even get into was, was I guess, uh, a Medicare Medicaid facility, which is a government run place. And yeah. not to say that they don't have good intentions, but they're limited by a certain budget. And I would say if you had to put a number on it, 90 percent of the people there don't want to be there. And the environment when you're around a bunch of people that don't want to actually change their lives or get better compared to an environment in a private facility where, you know, someone's spending a lot of money to be there or their, their private health insurance. So like they made a choice that like, they had to, they, they didn't have to go to the rehab. They've made a choice to go to the rehab. There's just night and day. It's a, and That's another true. thing about a Medi Medicare, Medicaid facility is, you know, um, the, you know, sometimes they have a three month waiting list to, to get, to get into them and addicts don't have three months uh, you know, or two months or whatever it is. You know, if someone is using, drugs and they want to get clean they they don't have three months to wait they could 
one dose nowadays is, you know, is killing people. So, yeah. you know, uh, my point in saying all of that is the, that's why we started the scholarship program at the rehab, which was, you know, completely free of charge. If somebody really wanted to get themselves together and they reached out to us and, you know, we, we, there was a vetting process to make sure they really wanted it. But if they did, we would bring them in and we, we scholarshiped over 100 people. Um, it could be it could be well over 100, but I do know for sure at least we had 100 because we calculated it at some point. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about that on a previous podcast. So I wanted to bring that up. And it, and in short, just to go over all of that in a short version is, you know, I grew up not being able to go to a private facility. I didn't have the money to go to one like that I created. And uh, I wanted to make that possible for people like me. Yeah, I, I think it's also, uh, I, one, it's great that you're doing, you know, what you're doing. And I think the one of the questions that came in the chat was, what was the inspiration? And it's, I, I, I see that it's a little bit personal for you because, you know, it's affected you. And it's, I think it's the, the concept of wanting to give back the thing that you thought was missing when you were going through it. Right. And there's, it, it, yeah, for me personally, for sure. And also, you know, a lot of my friends growing up suffered with addiction issues and mental health issues or both at the same time. Uh, as well as, you know, some parts of the, you know, especially my dad's side of the family, uh, like, you know, uh, some of them are actively using right now as we speak. Um, my uncle Richie overdosed not too long ago and, totally and passed that. away. Yeah. And, you know, it's been, uh, you know, I lost my best friend um, to, to addiction. I found him, you know, in his, uh, in his condo, in his bathroom, and he, he relapsed one night. And, you know, it all it took was that one time. And I walked in there and saw him, you know, in a, and you know something i'll never forget and yeah. there's just a lot of motivations for me to do what i did but you know i eventually i sold that facility um and i figured you know i'm gonna go back to my roots i'm gonna get back on a computer because that's what i know and i started um pentester.com with a few other guys that were, that were like-minded that have software companies and um they uh you know they're, they're business-minded and, and also have the, the software as a service mind so i i kind of in, yeah, I kind of jumped in in their lives quickly as soon as I sold the treatment centers, and um, and they didn't know too much about hacking, and you know, I, I showed them a couple things, and they both fell in love with it, and uh, and they've been learning ever since. But you know, we we started that business together, and Pentester is growing at a rapid pace, which is such a blessing to me. So, with, with the people that you said they were not involved in, you know, hacking, is that has that changed? Have you got into hacking now? Yeah, which is, I mean, for anyone here that's in cybersecurity, they, they know that, that if anyone asks them the, the stupid question of, teach me how to hack, you know, or, or um, you know, whatever, whatever way, version you're asked that question, it's not a cookie cutter solution for anybody. And yeah. it's very rare that not only one person sticks with it and takes, takes, the, you know, takes it into their own, their own hands and learns more without you helping them. Um, but both of my business partners that are heavily involved in Pentester have not only let me teach them the, the beginner type stuff and, and walk them through the, like this was a couple of years back, but they've taken the bull by the horns for other words and, and uh, they're incredible. It's, it's just unbelievable that two people, you know, <laughs> just the two random people that I, that I, was, I was friends with them prior, but two people yeah. that stuck with it, if that makes sense. So when you are, this is, I think, one of the, the good things that I want to, one of the things that people want to learn is for someone that doesn't have the cybersecurity background and you were mentoring them or you were teaching them the ways, what were some of the things that you taught them? What were, you know, how, walk me through that process. What are you teaching them? You know, how did you teach them and uh, what was the methodology behind it? So it, it actually is pretty simple because it's, it's a uh, kind of giving them the same approach that, that I took when I learned CTFs existed. Um, I already had a background in cybersecurity uh, on, and I, I learned a completely different way, maybe a little bit more complicated of a way than it is now because of the resources that were lacking back then. But, um, you know, when, when somebody wants, for example, I would say a mentorship or for me to teach them, in their case, it was more, I'm with them every day. So when I'm doing something, they're watching me do it and they wanted to learn certain things. So I would kind of say, hey, try this, uh, try this challenge or go through this walkthrough on Try Hack Me or Port Swigger Academy or, you know, Hacker 101, and just go through this stuff. And when you find a spot where, that you don't understand, um, you know, let me know, and I'll walk you through it, and it, so that you understand every part of it. Because that one important thing is, yeah, you could go on YouTube and watch a person do something and think that you understand it, but some people are hands-on 
learners. Like, like I'm a hands-on learner. If I watch you do something, I may have a general overview of what you did, but until I do it myself, it doesn't make complete sense to me. And I also believe that if you are going to learn anything about cybersecurity, that you have to you have to start somewhere. And then when when you're doing it, you, you know, using a tool, for example, if you don't understand what that tool is doing, you just see the result of it. You didn't learn anything. You just learned how to use a tool. And that, not to say there's no value in tool, tooling, but uh, you need to understand how the tool works to make it better or to use that tool more effectively or to use that tool in combination with other tools. Um, and I'm sure you can relate in the bug bounty world yeah. when you're, you're, you know, you're piping six different tools into each other to, to perform one thing. Um, you know, it's, it's important that you understand that stuff. And, and anyone that's learning, it's, it takes more than just watching other people hack things and, you know, you know, not understanding the process, but just typing out the commands you're reading on the screen or copy and pasting. And then you see that you got user or you got root on a machine, but you don't know how it happened. Um, you're, you're, do, you're actually doing yourself a disservice. I think there is a huge difference in knowing how to do something in theory than actually doing it. In theory, you know, you, I could probably do a lot in my car, right? I could open up the hood in theory. I may know a lot about it, but can I actually do these things, right? Or it, it's just like video games. In theory, I could be really good at playing, um, you know, Warzone. But unless you start playing the game, you know, you can do all the corners that people can. You can know all the good strats. You can know all the different things. But unless you're doing these things, it's never going to stick. I actually did a whole video on this when I said, like, I, I do an analogy of, like, hacking. It's like video games. When you when you when the new game comes out, the new version of this game come out, or new game you want to play comes out, what are you going to do? You're going to learn the maps. You're going to learn the, the guns. You're going to learn the attachments. And that's literally like hacking. The maps are, it could be the rooms. It could be the techniques. The tools are the guns. You know, it's all the the pieces that go in that analogy works with anything in life. It's just whatever you want to learn, you have to do it instead of just watching and learning and learning. And I think people get stuck in that pattern of just always, you know, taking content in and learning and learning and never actually trying it out. That's exactly right. You, you couldn't have said it better. Um, yeah. Yeah. So with, uh, with the stuff that uh, you, you, so you did pentester.com, you launched that. I've also seen you, a lot in, uh, so you talked about this a little bit. You said on social media, you, you know, there's a lot of new content that's coming out around what you do. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. What is the story behind how you're ending up in all this new um, podcast, these new shows? Um, what's going on for people that haven't seen them or don't know the whole story? Gotcha. So so there's a whole, whole story to that. And since we're streaming on two different platforms live, I'm just to let everyone know, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to censor a lot of what I'm saying. And uh, hold back on some things because of you know policies and terms and stuff like that. I don't want to get uh get uh, no, I'm second any trouble here. So I uh, I'll explain the story by just I guess starting from the beginning. So a couple of years back, three years ago, I got a text message from a friend's wife um, with some really really disturbing screenshots. Um, they were you know targeting children, and it was from a website on the clear web. And uh, I won't name the site for obvious reasons. But the, the website was available for anybody to view. Uh, it was a forum-based website, and anyone could read any of the threads without having to register. And she was like, can you do something about this? So, of course, at the moment, I didn't know if I could do anything about it at all. And uh, I just saw it. It disgusted me. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I left where I was at, and I went home, which... For me to do that was, was unlike me. I guess it, it flipped a switch or, or hit me in an area that, uh, I, I don't know, it, it bugged me. And yeah. um, I came home and uh, I looked at this website and my goal was to do whatever it took to get rid of it. Now, my original goal was I don't care if I have to be complete script kitty and, uh, and DDoS this thing. I'm going to do whatever it takes to just get rid of it. And uh, as well as reporting it and doing, doing the, the normal approach. Yeah. Um, so, you know, skipping all of the details that I can't talk about, I ended up being able to exfiltrate all of the data from that website, which included, uh, you know, email addresses, usernames, and, um, you know, a lot of user data. The one thing that I was, I was conscious of, even though I wasn't very familiar back then with, with this type of uh, content, was... That, uh, you know, I, I did have the common sense to not download any images or attachments That's or anything right. of that nature, because even if I have the best intentions in the world, 
um, being in possession of that stuff is still a crime, regardless yeah. of your intention. I made sure that when I did a MySQL dump on the database, um, that I only grabbed the, the, in the text. Um, you know, I was selective with my tables, <laughs> if that yeah, makes yeah. sense. So, uh, very you know, smart, I, by the way. That's a, that's a, that's a very, it's, it's very, <laughs> like, you don't think of that in the heat of the moment, but being able to think of that is huge, man. You, you, you saved yourself a lot of trouble by doing that. Well, I, I, I hope so, and I appreciate that. I mean, I, I like to make that very clear because right now, you know, I'm getting overwhelmed with so many people messaging me, so many different parts of law enforcement reaching out, a lot of nonprofits that are doing great things that work side by side with law enforcement that are reaching out, they would want to, they want to work together um, combating this cause. Um, but, you know, so from that point, um, after I got the data, I thought, okay, well, this is a slam dunk. You know, here's this horrible website. There's a change.org petition um, that where somebody brought up this website and there was over 100,000 people that signed it. I thought for sure that, that somebody in the government was going to do something back then. Yeah. And um, I reported it to a cyber tip line for the, uh, they called NICMIC for National Exploiting Missing Children. And uh, I, su I submitted it to there. I submitted it with, you know, the owner of the website's personal email address. And he happened to be a politician named Nathan Larson in Virginia wow. and who, who, who tried to run for Congress twice. And the guy was so dumb that I didn't have to do some deep OSINT to find out who this guy was. He used his personal Gmail address as his uh, admin email. So after I, I found that and I you know, looked into him a little bit after the fact, I realized that he was pretty radical in the, his beliefs. And I don't know much about politics. I don't care about politics. I'm not a, you know, some people assumed based upon some of the stuff that I said that I was leaning to one direction or people that I chose to work with because of their political party that I cared about politics. This is not about politics. If that's what you get out of this or you get out of the stories that you've heard me talk about and you're missing the entire point, um, I, I, number one, I don't know much about them in the first place. And number two, I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, or a flat earther, an alien. I don't care what you are. If you like kids, I don't like you. Very simple. So oh, yeah. I just want to make that clear for everyone out there that thinks this is a political agenda. This is about children being hurt. I mean, I feel like politicians are going to make that a political thing to save their asses, right? And it just shows that. And um, it's unfortunate that it becomes that way. And the moment you, quote unquote, I'm not saying you attack the politician, but in their eyes, you're attacking the politician. It becomes the other party wanting to you know, defame them when you have little proof of like this guy's uh probably ip address also where he logged in if, he, if he's dumb enough to use his personal email that is probably dumb enough to use his personal ip address. oh yeah yeah residential ip everything was you know the guy i don't think he was trying to hide the fact that he was a you know a, a word that i can't say but he um he he was you know he was running this website so i report all this information and i didn't hear anything back i called my attorney in florida and the attorney in Florida reported it to the task force, which was a local task force. I'm not sure which one it was, but he did report it. I called a, uh, another attorney in Virginia um, where that, that politician, his name's Nathan Larson, like I said, where he lived. And I asked them, they didn't really have any advice from me either. So I thought, okay, well, the only thing I can do is go to the media because why wouldn't the media want to run something on the clear web? There were children on this website that were, you yeah. know, for other words, you know, doing horrible things for grown, grown adults. And, you know, you couldn't see that type of stuff on the front end of the site. It, it, like it was, it was close to that type of stuff, but it was just enough to where it could be considered quote unquote fantasy. Um, yeah. And uh, I thought, okay, well, the media has to pick up on this. Parents need to know this website exists. And if they're not going to be able to take it down, they're going to at least have to address it. So I reached out to almost every media uh, organization you can imagine. I spoke to quite a bit of them. All of the reporters that I did speak to were very excited to talk. They, they seemed like this story was awesome and they, they wanted to run it. They were disgusted themselves with this whole thing. But the issue was literally every single one, no exaggeration, every single media uh, agency or reporter got back to me and told me that their legal team wouldn't run it. And my response to every single one of them was, okay, well then leave my name out of it. Leave the content that I you know, collected out of it and, um, and just run the fact that this website exists. The, the, the fact that it exists in the first place and that there's over 100,000 people that are signing a petition to take it down 
is, is enough proof in my eyes that it's media worthy. Um, none of them ran the story. And as I said before, it couldn't have made me more aggravated and more angry. So from that point on, you know, I, I started to find these, these groups on, the, on YouTube that hunt these guys down individually, one by one. And they have decoys where they, you know, they, they, they're, grown, they're grown people, but they pretend to be children. The same way Chris Hansen did it back in the Dateline yeah. NBC days. And um, he, uh, you know, uh, he, he would get them arrested on the scene. So I found a lot of organizations that were doing that same thing, just on a more public and YouTube level. And I thought, okay, well, I'll be, I'll be in the shadows and I'll help them out. I'll find information on these guys and some, sometimes women, but mostly men. Um, and, you know, and I, I'll keep my name out of it, but I just want to help. I want to do something constructive because nothing happened with this website. Um, I got to do something. I don't know. I, I think God put it in my place and it was a journey for me to go on. And I don't know why to this day, why he chose me to do that, but that's, it's the journey that I'm on. So six months of that goes by. And I see on the news that Nathan Larson is arrested in, at a yeah. yep, he's arrested at a layover in um, in Denver, Colorado, with a twelve year old girl that he did something horrible with and kidnapped. And um, you know that made me even more mad because they didn't bring up his website, they didn't do anything at all. And um, you know I I was just beside myself. I was like, this could have been prevented. I had in my eyes blatant evidence of this guy with, I, I wish that I could explain the words because uh, we're streaming live, I can't. But uh, if you watch my other interviews, you'll see some of the stuff that, that was said, not just from him, but by everybody on this website. Um, and then, uh, you know, to top that all off, um, uh, another fact about this website, while I'm going through the, the messages and the logs and the telegram group that they had, I noticed that Frederick, the owner of the Pirate Bay, was the one who not only configured the website, but was ho knowingly hosting the website. And I have uh, an email from him between Nathan Larson and Frederick um, from the Pirate Bay. Um, and it, his, his response, I can actually read it verbatim if you want, but off, you know, it, it, was, it, it sounded something like, you know, I went through the site, this doesn't look to be a CSAM, um, but it appears to be holiday photos of children and trolling. And holiday in other countries means vacation. There was, if you were to see this website, if anybody checks my other interviews out, you'll see that that is far from the truth. And, um, you know, I, I'd love to hear Frederick's, uh, uh, not opinion, I'd love to hear his response to why reason, he yeah. allowed this. I mean, look, I'm all for bulletproof hosting. I'm all for his activism and other, other ways. But, you know, and I'm not calling him, you know, I'm not calling, I'm not saying he's attracted to children, but I would really like to know why he supported this movement. Yeah. How did you miss that if you read it this side, you know? He didn't miss it. There's no way he missed it. It was, you know. No, but I mean, I want to hear the justification of how did you miss it. Yeah, I, I would too. And I, and I think a lot of people would. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I, I had respect for those three guys. And I'm sure it's not all of them. But I do know for a fact, um, with, with evidence, that, you know, they were, ho well, at least Frederick was hosting the website. Because there, there's a few different communications that I have between him and, and like I said, the guy Nathan Larson. So let's, I want to talk about the timeline of all these things that happened. So it was, so maybe before we talk about the timeline, for people that don't know, um, the, the second end of the story with the helping is you have a, a social media channel that you help that hunts these people that are doing illegal, act we can't, it's just so fucked up, we can't talk about it on these platforms, that they're doing illegal activity yeah. that involves children. You meet up with them. You call them out, you ask them for an explanation, and then when they leave, they get arrested. Exactly. So in those cases, like I said, there's a there's a decoy who is an adult, which we, we had a few, and um, they they you know they'll talk to a guy or, or yeah. a guy you know not, it's always the guy that reaches out first. It's the, a kid is going to act like a kid regardless. So the decoys yeah. pretend like they're kids, and they use filters on their faces because, like I said, they're grown people, and They'll have a conversation back and forth with that individual until they decide, you know, to meet up, which they call that luring or grooming. Mm -hmm. And it happens so quickly that it will blow your mind. And uh, instead of those people meeting up with what they believe is somebody younger, um, it's it's a, a, a professional MMA fighter and myself. And, um, 
you know, you would think in your head that the MMA fighter beats up uh, beats up all these guys. Well, that's not what happens. He's it, he just happens to be an MMA fighter and very very good. He's like undefeated and eight and zero, um, you know, on his way to the UFC. But you know, has the same heart that I I do for for helping kids. And he uh, his, his name's Scrappy. He also goes you know that, that's his like people know his fighting name, but his real name is Dustin Lampros. Great guy. Um, was on the reality show, uh, what was it? The Ultimate Fighter, if anyone here has seen that. And one day, him and I were sit- sitting um, at his his place, and I was telling him about what I'm talking about now. Yeah. You know, And I was in the shadows completely at this time. Like Nobody knew that I was doing this. It was just something I did on my own. And I told him what I was doing. I showed him an example of how quickly these guys will come out of nowhere. And he was he was blown away. That you know that I will because nobody talks about this until they yeah. see it and they realize how bad it is. So he was blown away and he was like, "I want to help. I want to do this." And him and I made the decision to do that together. And um, since then, we we've, we've caught a bunch of a bunch of people together. And uh, and as you as you know, YouTube and all these platforms are they, you know they don't like this this type of content. Yeah. And we have to be very careful with with how it's posted. There has to be police involvement and. You know, we regardless of us, you know, the people, even even the bad guys that we're running into, uh, they know we're not police officers. We're not putting our hands on them. We're not holding them against their will. We are just asking them questions about, you know, what they're there to do and who they were there to meet. And a lot of them lie in the beginning. But since I have basically all of their information, I have I have, you know, their names, their their jobs, their family members, their neighbors. Their criminal history. They have, they have debt. They have, they have lean. I mean, I'm, I come there with everything preloaded. So if they start walking away, pretending like they don't know what's going on, they know that this is not going to be the end of it. That everyone in their family that, and their career, everyone's going to find out. A lot of them choose to stay and talk, and um, and Scrappy or Dustin will will sometimes he'll, he'll have them do like push ups or you know sit ups and stuff like that. And really, it's you know it, it keeps the person there and. It's not really for entertainment or, or for even laughs, for that matter. It's more so just to kind of hold them there until the cops get there. And, uh, they, you know, we tell them, you know. Stall for the cops to show up. It's very, very smart, man. Thank you. And, it, and it's worked. You know, it's worked over and over again because we tell them, we say, hey, you know, if you talk to us and you tell the truth, we'll, we'll uh, you know, we, we won't call the police. But the police are already on their way. So it's no matter what, what the case is. What do the cops think of like when they show up? Do they ever question you guys in any way? Has there been any like I've always been curious to know like is there always a some sort of a you know weird interaction with the the cops or are they usually on on board with what you guys are doing? So it's 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 weird and depends on where you're at. So uh, my local area in my local city, the police here are incredible. It's called right. I live in Delray Beach and I, I'm not hiding. You know, people can find me pretty easily. Um, the Delray Beach police are fully in support of what we're doing. Obviously, they're worried about our safety, which makes yeah. sense. And they, they warn us about that and they advise against it. But at least when we do call them, they're very supportive of you know, what, you know, what we've done. And, you know, I've been outside of my city catching these guys and we get different responses from the police. You know, they, they, they're a little bit less reactive. They're they're not uh they're not really on board the same way that the local police are and i and i've noticed that across a lot of the other channels that do this type of stuff on youtube and other platforms that the police in some areas are ready to you know at least try charging them charging doesn't turn into a conviction in all cases but but uh, at least the police will sit there build a case against them figure out which charges they can charge them with and see what happens with their district attorney or state attorney and whatever you know that, that's how it goes but yeah, it's a. Uh, I've had different responses in different areas and across the country with the other organizations. Same, same exact circumstance. So we're like, you know, yeah, police. You never know. Mm-hmm. It's very weird. When you uh, so you know, when you find these people on, for when you catch them, are you pretty much OSINTing who they are? Is that the, the concept of you pretty much using OSINT to figure out, you know, what, what their name, what their Facebook is, and where they work, and that kind of work? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes it will be, you know, a username or that they'll use somewhere else. Or sometimes they'll yeah. they'll give a real phone number, which makes it really easy. Or sometimes they'll use their real name and that makes it easy. But then the difficult ones are, let's say they just have a picture of a logo on their T-shirt. And that, that logo is you know, somewhere local, but we don't know the person's name. They're portraying to be somebody else. 
none of their other information is real. So in that case, uh, one guy that, that we caught, um, this is, you know, Dustin and I, um, not one, not in any of the other organizations. That, that was a whole, that, these are all different stories and that's, I guess, private, but between Dustin and I, we were very public about it. Um, one of the guys had an electrical, uh, electrician company, ta uh, not tattooed, um, uh, on his t-shirt and it's I found logo out there was, of the company was on. Yeah, yeah, it was just a small, a small little logo and doing some serious, you know, reverse image searching, which didn't come up right away with that, with that logo. Um, it took, it took a, a lot of work and messing around with some of the, you know, like cropping the image and, and taking parts of it to find this small company. And I saw there was only a few employees, so it, it can only have been a few people. And once I did Ocean on the entire company, I was able to tell who the person was when we met up with them because I had the, the pictures of the faces of everyone that worked at the company. And I had a file together for all of them. So in those cases, it takes a long time and you, you run the risk of them just walking away and that's it, you know, it's, but at yeah. the end of the day, it's, it's worth it for the kids and it's, it's worth it because there's a potential conviction. But, you know, unfortunately, like I said, you know, the, there, yes, there's a ton of value in exposing them and it's showing the community that that person is likely a dangerous individual and you should keep your kids away from them. But being a, what they consider vigilante, like taking the law into your own hands, sometimes doesn't work out in court because the evidence is not always uh, usable if it's obtained by an individual. So, you know, it's, I'm trying at the moment right now to figure out uh, what is the best path for me to use my abilities, to make a large impact and get as many convictions as possible, whether that means I'm public about it or not, because I don't care about the recognition. I don't care about having, you know, the stamp of approval from anybody. This is just about helping kids and that's it. And, uh, right. and that kind of segues me into one more thing. And I didn't mean to be in the spotlight about this. I know a lot of people saw my my podcast and all this and, and probably thought, well, you know, this and you know, that, that I was trying to get attention. And, and really, the, the ver really, the version of how this all happened was since Scrappy was is a professional MMA fighter, once he started posting it on Instagram, a lot of MMA blogs and MMA podcasts wanted to talk about it and post about it. And since he was so new to the topic and I wasn't, and I, and I, I knew I, I had the, the computer side of things and he had the muscle and the image side of things. So I was like, you know, I wanted to make sure that I went on these podcasts and on these, these interviews with him so that if they asked the question that there was always an answer or at least an answer that it made more, made sense. But, you know, this was right in the beginning when we first started. And one of those podcasts was called the Slick and Thick Show. And there was only a couple hundred followers at the time when we went on the show. And there was a clip of me telling that same story about um, I, I saw a, a post of a child that, you know, a post on this website about a child that was in the bathtub. And it, it was a parent that, you know, it was a parent that posted their own child in the bathtub right. and said, they have no idea what's going to happen to them tonight. And then underneath of it, there were a bunch of people te telling that person what they, were, they, what they would do to that person's child. And I told that story on this small podcast and that one clip out of this two hour or so podcast went insanely viral on Instagram. And, you know, all these media groups reached out to me, one of them being Project Veritas. And then uh, the Sean Ryan show reached out to me and said, you know, I'm focusing on this topic and I would really love to have you on. And, and that is, you know, that that's how I ended up in the spotlight for other words. And yeah, it's just, it, I don't know. I, it not, I don't know. It, life is wild, man. I, I think though that, 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 you know, there's a, it's a good thing that it went viral because a, it's, I think it's going to hopefully change the way um, that industry, I don't want to say industry, that whole co topic, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I, it's so hard that we can't say these things. You're raising awareness about something that there is not a lot of awareness going on around that no one's, there is, it's not a lucrative industry that people could make money because no one's in the no big court which is going to support it so you doing that and going on these podcasts to raise awareness is a huge thing but it also shows the power of like ethical hacking even though what you're doing you consider it as a vigilante and i agree it is some sort of a vigilante but at the same time it's showing that you know hackers are no longer the people that are you know robbing people or breaking into banks dumping people's data they're doing something different um, by protecting children by protecting you know by um exposing people that are in 
places of power that could, you know, think they're untouchable and exposing them that they're doing these kinds of things. So I, I know that it's a, I, I'm sure it's a very hard place to be in for you right now, especially because you're in the, you're in the uh, spotlight, everything's just moving quick, things are just happening and it's going to be a rough few months with everything that's happening. But yeah. I think it's a, it's a great thing to, to, to going from uh, someone that was just doing CTFs. I know you had a hacking background, but you were just doing CTFs and figuring out what you wanted to do and you wanted to do pentester.com, but then you also started doing this project on the side for you know, protecting your local community and then you know, eventually getting national uh, attention of national, not even national, but like podcasts that are, have huge, huge numbers of people watching. Right. It's that. been It's been a couple hundred million views around all of the social media platforms and that's just been not only humbling, but amazing because I, I've had, I've had mothers come up to me in public. Now I had one that was crying a couple of days ago, come up to me and hug me and thank me so much. And I, and I was just like, you know, my goal is to educate parents and help kids. That's, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, to realize how much of an impact I'm actually having by just, just my words at this point, because I haven't, you know, I, I'm trying to find a good app to recommend to parents to monitor their kids. I'm trying to find, you know, like I said, the not a nonprofit or, that works in tandem with the, with the government or, or law enforcement. There's so many things that I am, I'm in the process of doing. And I feel like if I've already made an impact, it's, it's just a blessing, man. And I, yeah. uh, I, I, you know, it makes, it makes me really happy. And one thing I wanted to bring up too about Pentester, because, you know, Pentester has been a project and right now we're, we're in beta, you know, we launched and uh, the, uh, the podcast obviously shot us forward pretty, pretty far. Um, but we're still a beta product and we're, we're, we're growing. But uh, I did incorporate a lot of my OSINT and, uh, and you know, uh, my methodologies into the platform. You know, I, I tried to take some of my recon um, and OSINT abilities or, or methodologies and turn them into a practical, easy solution for anyone of all skill sets to learn, including, like, you know, for example, we have a tool called DarkWatch, which has 140 billion records, not just credentials, but, uh, you know, sensitive information. It could be, you know, your social security number, your credit card, your home address. It could have, you know, all kinds of information. And that data is extremely useful when you're trying to look for an individual like these horrible people. Or sure. it could be if you're looking into yourself, it's kind of good to know what's out there because, you know, your browser is going to tell you if there's credentials exposed. There's plenty of apps that are going to tell you that, but they're not going to tell you the sensitive info. Um, it just isn't available. So we we have a very large database to, to go through, um, you know, on your own and, and, and make sure that you, whatever's out there that you can change, that you do change. And uh, we have an, a facial recognition um, uh, widget called Identity IQ, which is similar to a reverse image search, but instead of a, you know, matching a directly from one image to another image, um, it's, I'm sorry, from uh, one identical image to another identical image, no. it will take 120 measurements of the human face and compare that to an extremely large data set and uh, show you everywhere that your face is posted online. So uh, in for the average person, for an individual, you may want to know where you're at. You know, sometimes people are posted places they don't even know they're posted. And then if you're a bad person, somebody that we've been actively, you know, investigating or looking at, it's sometimes easy to identify somebody if they have, let's say, a dating profile or a social media profile on the internet that will expose their real name and location. So we we build all those tools into Pentester and it's been doing really well. People are really liking these products. Nice. You mentioned uh you mentioned OSINT. Can you tell people that don't know what OSINT is? I, don't, I think our audience is very familiar with OSINT, but for people that are watching and don't know what OSINT is, tell us what OSINT is and how do you use, you know, what do you do with OSINT? So OSINT stands for Open Source Intelligence. And I believe that anybody, you know, if you have the hacker mindset, which is just, uh, you know, if, if, if you want, if, if you have that mentality where you look at something and you analyze it or you can, it, you know, let's say it's a remote control for your TV. If you look at that and you find a way to take it apart and put it back together, and make it do something that it doesn't, you know, it, it wasn't intended to do that. That's the ha hacker mentality. And, you know, you don't need to even, you know, you don't need to be a, a, a programmer or a, or a script or even what, what we talked about recently. Uh, ben, yeah. But you, know, you don't need any of that. You just need the mindset to get started. And with OSINT specifically, um, if you have that hacker mindset, it's about putting the pieces together or solving that puzzle. And, and a lot of times it comes from little bits of data or images or from some hints, like you may hear somebody's voice and, 
then you go through you know a hundred audio samples of that person and or, or a bunch of people and try to figure out which one is that person's voice based on this spectrogram of that audio. I mean, just a random like random examples. But OSINT can be anything. It could all, all different layers of uh, of you know public records, um, credentials, as I was just talking about, images on the internet, social media, archives of websites. Uh, just you know, I, I could, the list could go on forever, but it's, it's just information publicly available on the internet that you build a case with. I think with, with OSINT also, it's it's just um, it's not. I, I don't want to say it's not hacking, but it's just the analyzing human behavior and knowing where people make mistakes, uh, and then just tracking them down. With, with with what you do specifically, you're just OSINTing people, but it could go also beyond that, right? It could be just not people and. Uh, identifying people, but it could also go into like recon and hacking and that sort of stuff. But in the case of what you do, OSINT could be a very, very powerful thing. For sure, for sure. In this case, uh, it's it's proven to be very good for, you know, I guess serving whatever type of justice an individual can serve. You know, I'm not law enforcement, so I can only do so much, but OSINT has been really the main the main source behind all of this. Yeah. So uh, for people that are watching this and they want to, you know, follow you or hear more about you, where can they find you? I know you're on, uh, you're on Twitter. What yep. are any other social media new ones that you have enrolled in that you want people to follow you on or watch your content? So um, I, I recently, you know, like as you know, went pretty viral. So I, a lot of people went to my Instagram, which is Instagram.com/slash zero day. It's the number zero and then D A Y. And surprisingly, uh, Chloe Kardashian shared my shared my story two days ago. Holy shit. Got, yeah, man, that blood blew my mind. Three hundred and seven million followers. She threw it up on her story, and I was just, you know, I looked into it. And it looked like it for a, for a, like if I was to pay for something like a fifteen second story post is a is a million dollars for one of the Kardashians. Wow. And look, I don't know anything about the Kardashians, nor do I follow them. But when I saw that, I was like, wow. Not only is that brave of her, but um, just surprising, you know. Yeah. Was not expecting it in the slightest. But yeah, my Instagram is is what you just posted in on the on the bottom of the screen, and um, my YouTube got seven thousand subscribers, and I, I don't even really have any content. So I got to figure that part out, and that's just uh, I think it's just Ryan Montgomery, and uh, I made a TikTok from a from a friend. Um, his name's Kev, but he goes by Serho or, or I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, it's, he's with Alsec. And uh, he showed me a little bit about TikTok, and I'm going to try my best there too. And that one's just zero day CTF. And uh, also, zero day CTF is your um, Twitter too, right? That's my Twitter as well. Yes, Twitter is. You know, I'm I'm trying. It's hard. It's very hard on Twitter to, is you know, yeah. for me, I could talk about my company, I could talk about you know the current project, and I can share some of the tools that I like. But I'm not a content creator like you at this moment, so there's so only so much that I can share. So I'm trying. We can talk about it all the time. I'll be happy to help you give you, you know, get you with the content. I think there is a, we're in an age of content creation and I think uh, it's the next, it's the next thing that's going to be the next booming industry that it's going to be if it's not already there. Uh, I appreciate before we that. Wrap up, I think we, I want to also be courteous to your time. Before we wrap it up, what can we expect next from you? Are you going to be at DEF CON? I'll definitely be at DEF CON this okay. year. And um, what you can expect next from me is hopefully, like I said, I'll be in partnership that this is not for financial gain so if you see anything i'm not being paid for it i i made a commitment to myself there'd be no money to be made doing this at all um so if i do start posting about an application it's because i truly believe that application is trustworthy and good um meaning like an application to help you monitor your children um uh, that that's definitely something you'll be seeing from me soon and then after that i'll be working with some sort of charity nonprofit that works in tandem with law enforcement as i said and um they uh you know they, where i can get more of these guys prosecuted not just individually but even rings and people that are potentially trafficking adults it, it doesn't have to just be children so a lot more to come and uh you know i appreciate everything there there was one more thing if you don't mind me addressing absolutely man go for it so you know as i said earlier um there was people that were upset about the the political side of things. And as you know, and as I just said, I don't care about the politics. I don't know anything about it. It has nothing to do with politics. But, you know, from that same group of people, they started to dig into my past and look into me as a child. 
And I noticed that there was quite a lot of people that were posting stuff from my MySpace days when I was like 13, 14 years old and doing drugs and acting like a moron back then. And, um, you know, I, I used a really stupid name. Do you remember the scene kid days, like the emo kid days? Yeah. Well, back then everybody had a stupid name like like uh, Kiki Cannibal and Claudia Curbstomp and Zoe Suicide, like all these stupid names. And, yeah. and I was one of those kids that had a stupid name. And people were, you know, are trying to judge me based upon that. But the problem is for them is that there's no substance behind it. There's no, they have no, they have nothing other than a stupid name I used as a 13, 14 year old child. But it's just like, I guess no matter where I go, the, the trolls are going to make the loudest noise. And what I said on my speech at Hack Miami was, you know, if you look at yourself even five years ago and you don't cringe at the stuff that you said, then I don't think you're really growing as a human being. So and I'm looking at myself from, I guess, what would it be, 15 years ago? And these people yeah. are posting photos of me relentlessly on, you know, all, all, like cer certain platforms. And I think they're just not looking at the dates. They don't realize that this is like, you know, I'll be 30 in July. And these photos are when I was like 13, 14 years old with long black hair and piercings and tattoos. And yeah, of course, being a kid with tattoos is, is different, but I didn't grow up in the best area. And, you know, I, I didn't have a normal upbringing. So, you know, I, I don't have much to say about it other than I'm sorry that I used a dumb name as a child. And uh, that's, you know, that, that's it. You know, there's nothing you're going to find about me. It's I mean, so man, like, if the only thing they got on you is what you did from when you were a teenager, a 13 year old teenager, then I don't think you have much to worry about. I think everyone's done stupid things on there as a kid. And then when they were 13, 14, and I noticed that someone in the comments said, Oh my God, you had a child childhood. Like you did something dumb as a kid. Wow. Like how dare you? Right. Yeah. You think, I think, man. I think what you're doing is uh, the fact that you are doing this for, you're not doing this for personal gain and you're doing this, purely to do something good for the community for your for your community your local city your local community uh, it goes to show i wouldn't worry about the past i think a lot of people have seen a lot of the things that you have done in the recent years outside of what you just discussed like you've had you've built a really cool community around yourself as well man like you have a lot of supporters that are big in the community also that know who you are as a person and i think your your uh your intentions are very clear and as long as you're okay with it on a personal level, you within yourself, you believe what you're doing and you agree with it, then none of that fucking matters. They can people people could dig up your past and I don't think it fucking matters, man. We're all well, that mean that means a lot because there's you know, I've been beyond stressed out, as I said, with over overwhelming with positivity, but also stressed of you know the negativity and just you know, just being in fear of, of you know, because I keep getting constant reminders like be careful, you need a security guard at your door, you need this, you need that. Like people are just you know, telling me all these horrible things that, that could, because this is such a touchy subject and I'm yeah. kind of poking a, I'm, I'm poking a dangerous bear, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like, I understand that. So it's just, you know, bringing, bringing stress that I wouldn't have had otherwise and being in the spotlight, I guess, isn't something I knew I've ever felt before. And I'm in the spotlight for something that a lot of the world supports, but the people that don't support it can be very dangerous. Oh, so, you know, just, you know, I guess maybe just people talking crap on top of it just adds adds a layer of stress that I don't need right now. And I'm um, trying my best yeah. to help people and trying my best to continue doing what I've been doing my whole life. And that's been, you know, trying to to assist others. And and I don't know, I, I fall short, you know, on my own my own self trying to help others. I guess so. I gotta I gotta worry about that. I I don't know. I'm rambling, but no, yeah, I think uh, it's unfortunate because there's politics involved around it. Uh, by the end of the day, if you were if you weren't getting a lot of this hate, man, then you weren't doing something right. So when you're doing something right, that's you know hitting on the right places, then you're gonna get some flock, and people are gonna not you know be supportive, and you're gonna get that kind of hate. I think what you're doing is incredibly cool, and it's incredible that you're doing to help kids. And I would just you know that let that speak for it, and not worry about the noise that's coming around it. I appreciate that very much, bro, and uh, obviously likewise with you. <laughs> Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming on the stream, man, uh, and you know, doing this with me. Thanks so much for uh, you know just taking the invite to come on here and chat with me. I really, really appreciate it, uh, and I can't wait to see you at DefCon, dude. And I know uh, hopefully we get to do some you know fun stuff like last year at DefCon together again. Yep, I can't wait, and I will see you there. Can't spill the beans too much, but I will see you at DefCon, and uh, I can't wait to see you again, dude. Sounds good, bro. Can't wait. Cool. See you, dude. Peace.